from around the world and to our panelists uh, to this sort of inauguration of sorts program um, that the Mittal Institute and CSMVS Museum have been developing over the past six, eight months or so. Uh, we're starting off with two part lecture series, the one today, um, and then another one on next Thursday. And details of that will be available on the chat link uh, and on our website. I'm the executive director of the Mittal Institute and we bring faculty and students from across Harvard together and connect them with scholars of South Asia across the disciplines of arts and humanities, social science and the science, all with the intention to generate new knowledge and disseminate it widely. I want to thank our administrative team, particularly who've been working behind the scenes. As you know, so much effort goes into bringing public programs to the audience. And so staff both at the Mittal Institute and the museum have worked together. I also, of course, want to acknowledge Anupam, who's been really a true partner in guiding uh, and helping develop contours of this program, what we're calling Conservation Science Training and Research, uh, short for COSTAR. Um, the little bit about the program, uh, our intention or the idea is to build a knowledge hub on heritage conservation related to South Asia. And the idea is to organize resources for conservation practices in South Asia and beyond and to advocate for sharing knowledge because so much exists, but we also know that they operate in silos across museums, cultural institutions, academic institutions. And so how do we bring this knowledge together amongst not just historians, art historians or scientists, but museum professionals and you know, the, 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 the citizens who care about uh, cultural heritage. So in the first year, what we are hoping to do is starting next year in 2021, offer an introductory program. And the idea would be to focus on the technical aspects of art history, how art is made, and then combine it with scientific studies on conservation of South Asian art. The program curriculum we hope will combine theory and practical work, which will be focused on uh, research, um, and then the intention again is to connect individuals and institutions who are keen on building up their own facilities for art conservation research and also include students in components of our program who are currently enrolled in the graduate uh, program on museum studies. Um, more information will be uploaded on our website as the program develops. Uh, we also have uh, launched an email address, which is again available to you. If you have any queries about our program or also want to share the work you're doing, we're hoping to bring more of these kinds of public talks to the larger public and we would love to hear from you on that. Um, and I'll move forward to uh, the next part of the program, which is to introduce Mr. Mukherjee who is a dear friend, I would say, because uh, Mr. Mukherjee came to Harvard way back in 2014, I believe, and he was invited by Professor Rahul Merotra to give a talk on art and communities and museums. And that's when I had the privilege of being introduced to you, Mr. Mukherjee. And since then, it's been a wonderful journey. Uh, I don't think he needs introduction, but Mr. Mukherjee is the director of the CSMBS uh, Museum in Mumbai. And uh, he's also the director of the program on museology and art conservation at the museum. Over the 13 years of his tenure, Mr. Mukherjee has transformed the museum and made it into a state-of-the-art facility and also a hub for civic engagement. You know, his work, uh, and those who work alongside with him at the museum, their staff uh, have really helped open minds of many of us to become stewards of our rich heritage. And Mr. Mukherjee's advocacy goes beyond the walls of his museums and, about, uh, of his museum, and he thinks very broadly about the institution's place in the larger urban context. So I'm very grateful, Mr. Mukherjee, for your 
support and for joining hands with the Mittal Institute. And with that, I'm gonna now turn over the event to you. Thank you. Thank you, Meena, for your wonderful introduction. Good evening from Mumbai. Good morning, good afternoon. Pleased to meet you all on the digital platform, unfortunately, <laughs> not in physical space. And the, the current health crisis uh, all over the world due to the pandemic is perhaps one of the worst human and economic crises in the history of mankind. It has exposed many loopholes and inconsistencies in our policies, planning, and thinking process. The continued closure of museums, libraries, archives, and other cultural institutions is, is now jeopardizing funding opportunities for artists and cultural professionals and for the conservation of cultural property. Only thing we know at the moment of crisis that culture gives us hope and conservation makes us resilient. With this background, I welcome panelists of this evening and viewers across the globe for attending the first session of a two-part series of panel discussion. Thank you, Mina, and your dedicated team for hosting the series panel discussion during pandemic. And my sincere thanks to members of the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute, Harvard University, for partnering with us. Such conversation on digital format will help museums, archives, libraries, collectors, and students of art conservation understand the history of conservation research and material culture and how different material behave differently in different climates. The CSMBS Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Bastu Shangrala, it's a very big and complicated name, formerly Prince of Wales Museum of Western India, is one of the leading progressive institutes in the country, constantly investing its resources in modern conservation research and practices. And this is one of the institutes in the country not supported by the government, supported by the people, people of Mumbai largely. We seem to have lost Mr. Mukherjee, but hopefully should be joining back again shortly. Anupam, if you wanna take things over, unmute. It's interesting. Uh, it is interesting that uh, Mr. Mukherjee talked about uh, a time when policies and planning sort of fell short to some extent, but, uh, and that culture gives us hope and that cu cultural conservation makes us resilient. So. Uh, it's right down on track that during this period when we had the um, opportunity or may I say even privilege to be able to work and to build up this program, um, that this has uh, fruited into this, um, this first of the two panel discussions. And um, um, we are here from different parts of the world and um, for this discussion on conservation science and research. And we have with us, um, uh, we have with us uh, Alison. Alison is here. She's the project manager, strategic planning and research at the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, which we uh, refer to with affection also as ECRON in Rome. Uh, many of you, you know Alison, and she's a heritage scientist. She is a wall painting conservator. Uh, you've been with ECROM for like since 2010, 2011. And at, at present, she acts, Alison acts as a focal point for research at ECROM, responsible for coordinating uh, horizon scanning of the cultural sector, uh, as well as program outcome monitoring and evaluation. Um, uh, you also promote um, a lot of collaborative practices in heritage science. Um, especially re in relation to its uh, relevance and impact for conservation and onto larger societal um, aspects, um, including you know linking up linking it up with sustainable development. 
so thank you, Alison, for being with us. Thank you very much. Uh, we have with us um, uh, one of the mentors of this program and um, uh, Narayan, Narayan Kandekar. He is the director of the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies at um, Harvard University. He leads the center's activities, its conservation and research programs. Uh, and also, uh, if, if I'm right, at the Center for the Technical Study of Modern Art at the Harvard Art Museums. Um, um, Narayan has specialized in the scientific analysis of paintings and painted surfaces and also published extensively. You're a member of various art committees. Uh, you've coordinated so many international groups on conservation science. Um, uh, and um, um, the, the very beautiful and um, um, Forbes pigment collection and the Gettins collection of binding mead and varnishes are uh, under his custodianship and which he shares with much, um, with much personal investment. Thank you, Narayan, for sharing that beautiful collection with everybody and informing conservation science in a way with the resource base that you have created there. Of course, Narayan has a lovely team with him there and uh, they all work together on that. Uh, from the United, from UK, we have um, Austin. Um, Austin is the head of the Department of Conservation at the Cotol Institute of Art, London. And um, 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 uh, the department actually has been um, uh, uniting easel painting and wall painting conservation with the transdisciplinary research and preventive conservation, as well as technical art history and conservation science and practice. So it's it's a great laboratory itself, the Kotal Institute of Art, I think, and with wonderful colleagues that he has, like Aviva Bernstock and Dr. Deborah Swallow. I think that's a great place, and we are very grateful that um, that uh, that Nevin has been uh, is here with us. Um, of course, his research, his personal research is also focused on um, conservation analysis of paintings, both ancient and modern. And uh, with, this, with this rich background that he has, he's, uh, well, he's presently the vice president and a fellow of the International Institute for the Conservation of Artistic and Historic Works and the editor of Cultural Heritage Science and Studies in Conservation. So Nevin, um, Austin Nevin, we look forward to a lot of support with you over the, over the years as this uh, program um, builds up and uh, takes a, a tangible form, so to speak. And of course, we have Stefan with us, Stefan Simon, who is the director of the Radgen Forschungs Labo, uh, the Staatlich Museum in Berlin. Um, uh, this is one of the oldest laboratories in the world, actually. And Simon's work is dedicated to advancing heritage science in a sustainable manner. Um, uh, Stefan has always been, over the, over, the, over the last decade that we've known him, he's been a leading voice in the international culture and crisis subject, as well as the Green Museum debate uh, in the light of climate change. Um, Stefan's research has particularly focused on um, uh, the development of analytical technologies, questions of conservation documentation, and access in, in today's digital age. Uh, and a very important area of his work is also the study of authenticity questions. So thank you, Stefan. Thank you for being with us today. Um, uh, and um, because we have a varied audience here, um, and as this topic uh, um, as the topic of this discussion is on conservation science and research, um, let's simply reiterate the fact that um, art conservation, if we relate it to a fairly acceptable definition of an action aimed at increasing or enhancing the life of art object, now for art conservation to be effected, there is a process. And the process involves knowing the materiality of the collection, the technical studies, there's analysis, uh, there are non-invasive um, techniques to go into uh, the root of the things that form the art object, be it spectrometry, be it chromatography. Uh, the process also involves knowing the factors of deterioration that may impact the collection, as well as the mechanisms of this deterioration. There is 
the next step in the process about monitoring these factors. They could be atmospheric pollution, they could be light, they could be various other factors, inherent, inherent reasons why things degrade. And then the process goes on to once you're informed with all of this is about taking preventive measures or otherwise implementing remedial conservation treatment to arrest active deterioration. So with these elements as part of the process, it is natural that this is a multidisciplinary field. It is, as many say, an interdisciplinary field. And as things stand today, there is a school where it's saying it's a transdisciplinary field. And these fields stem not just from the sciences such as physics and chemistry and microbiology, but we are also looking at, we're looking at art history. After all, when we are talking about art objects, in the course of the life of a historic or artistic work, there are various interactions, right from acquisition, which requires an understanding of the material, its health, its authenticity. Uh, there is the aspect of the registration of the object. There is the aspect of a proper logical way of handling and transporting the object. There are exhibitions, there are publications, which would require genuine information about the object, its medium, its technique. So while art conservation aims to increase the longevity of the object and restoration would enhance the message of the cultural element, you see all these other events in the life of an art object are also those that require an element of scientific inquiry. And hence, and hence this leads to this fear of conservation science. And Narayan at the very beginning mentioned, or Meena mentioned, there was this term that came up was technical art history. And, and, um, and uh, in fact, the, the idea of technical art history first took root at Harvard. Uh, and Dr. Kandekar and other panelists may share the views as and when your thoughts bear fruit. Uh, but um, what are these relationships between scientific, art historical, research, and curatorial studies. How do these relationships inform each other? Dr. Kandekar, would you like to um, set the ball rolling with um, fruiting this thought? Sure, Th thank you so much, Anupam. Um, so I, I just wanted to set the scene a little bit as well with um, the, the evolution of technical art history because it really started with Edward Forbes when he became the director of the museum in 1909. So that's 111 years ago. And he really came, what's, what's important first of all is that he was a director that supported conservation and established an important conservation center and wanted to insert science into the understanding of a work of art. So he employed the first scientist in the world that was focused on fine art. Stefan's lab was the first conservation science lab. But so Edward Forbes was setting up this, this um, center for looking at how art was made and with a very strong interest in the process of art making. And that came from Edward Forbes being a, um, an amateur artist himself. And so he came with this sort of wide ranging intellectual curiosity about how art is made, how to find out how art is made, and also how to buy good works of art. He was trying to build a collection of real, um, real art in the, um, at, the, at the fog at the time because it was otherwise just a, a series of copies, plaster casts, photographs, lithographs, and so on. So right from the beginning, this respect, and I think this is the, the underlying point here is that there, there is respect and communication between curators, conservators, and scientists. And we all talk to each other. We found ways to communicate the information that we have. And it's very, very important as scientists to be able to talk to curators who may not have even thought of science since high school. So what we're doing is giving them complicated information in a way that they can comprehend. And then what they're doing is giving us information. So we can provide the data. We can say this pigment exists, this binding media was used, whatever the, the findings we have. But what 
the curators can do is help us understand and put the things into context. And we're working with the understanding that conservators, curators, and scientists are all giving different perspectives that give a much greater understanding of the whole. So we're not saying our perspective is the right one, the only one, the only valid point of view. We're sharing the stage with other people who also bring insights. And so we're getting a, a more whole holistic view of what the object is about, its history, what is buried, what information is buried inside the object and extracting it and then interpreting it in, in the largest way possible. So it's a it's something that we've done for a, a long time at the, the Harvard Art Museums. It's something that we are very proud of as our um, as part of our heritage really, this this starting point for technical art history because it's a it's a I guess what I, I, I want to say is that if we can bring people into a museum and have them a pre people who may not understand art from an art historical perspective, but can understand it from a material perspective, we can give them other ways of entering into a museum, other ways of understanding a work of art and appreciating it, then I feel like we've done a good job. And that's very, very important to us to, to give people different ways of approaching a work of art. And then they will pick up the other information from the other perspectives at the same time. So we, we're, we're opening three doors rather than one using this, um, this, this idea of technical art history. Yeah. And, and how, um, how much do curators interact? How much does the art history um, community approach the scientists consciously or is it just on occasions when something is particularly required? There is not a regular um, conversation that's going on, is there, at the moment? Well, actually, with in our institution, there is a regular conversation. I talk with curators. When we're in the building, I talk with them every day. They're always coming up into the labs. They're always talking about what's going on in the labs. The conservators go down, talk to them. We have meetings all the time. So it's actually baked into the fabric of our institution. There's some... We're not... We don't have silos of activity. What it is, is it's much more of a, a cross-disciplinary sort of horizontal activity. And right. that, that's important actually for this kind of work because otherwise you have people doing things on their own and not communicating it to the rest of the institution. You get people having some kind of um, feeling that they, they, they own the information and that's not the case. We work very much on an open and shared platform. And we're not threatened by other people knowing what we know or sharing what we know, even if it's not finished. We're very committed to having a, an honest conversation so that people can participate. And out of that conversation comes the best understanding of a work of art. You don't you hold the information close, you lose so much. So, evidence, so the work that the curators are doing is, is extremely relevant. It's extremely important, right? Absolutely, and essential. Similarly the, similarly, the work that the conservation scientists and, and other people involved in this and with a buy-in into this are doing is also important. And um, there was uh, this uh, Ikram forum that took place in 2013 was uh, a one uh, one forum where a lot of people from almost every continent took part, and uh, in fact, Alison was coordinating this whole thing. So this aspect of um, the impact and relevance, you know, after all, we had, we are having this this conversation first of all because we acknowledge that it is extremely relevant. Alison, you have some thoughts on this. Yes, thank you, Anna Pam. Uh, yes, there was. It seems a long time ago now, actually, the, <laughs> the forum. But um, it's interesting, actually, also looking back and and thinking uh, about uh, you know those the discussions that we had then and the recommendations that were made, and also the the journey that I think this field has been on um, since. Um, I was just also reflecting a little bit when, when we're talking about conservation science and, and this is something also that came up at the forum, 
a, in, in terms of actually what do we, um, what do we include within that? And what do we see as the function of conservation science is quite a broad question. And it's very interesting looking back then that already we were talking about heritage science as being a wider concept for the science, you know, the interdisciplinary, and we've, ha we've had that word already <laughs> today, the interdisciplinary study of heritage. And I think very much that conservation science fits in within that wider uh, definition, which then you could also then connect to areas like uh, technical art history, for example, which as Narayan was uh, very nicely, uh, it, how to say, um, uh, explaining to us how that also then leads to uh, a greater understanding um, and appreciation of heritage. I think that what's really interesting here is that when we, suddenly at ECROM, I mean, we for, for many, many years have um, uh, promoted a values-based approach to conservation and in particular a people-centered approach. Uh, people-centered approach to, to conservation, both of which really um, are based on what matters to people. You know, what, what, what are the values that really matter to people and what is it about heritage that really matters to them? And therefore, I would also argue for a slightly broader vision of conservation science, which also takes into account not just materiality, but also the social values and the cultural values that go with that and therefore would extend into areas such as social sciences, also um, health sciences. There've been some fantastic work done showing how heritage, you know, the, the interaction with cultural heritage actually is good for your health and good for your well-being. And, and I think that these are very interesting areas. As Narayan was saying, how through uh, how science can actually uh, you know unlock and reveal more meaning and significance in heritage, not just for um, you know expert specialists, art, art historians, curators, and the like, but but also just for generally for the visiting public. And I think this is very important to bear in mind, especially as Mr. Mukherjee was pointing out, when you have museums that are funded by the public, the public facing institutions. Mm -hmm. so, so if, yeah, so um, um, I'd request all the panelists to please join in whenever they feel like in this conversation, right? So um, just just uh, hearing Alison and if, if this is a fact that, um, uh, that um, conservation science and its interactions and cultural heritage as such, um, it has extremely positive impact and people realize there is a certain value in it, uh, both with the intangibles as well as the tangibles. Well, well if, if this is acknowledged that it has value and uh, there is relevant impact, all of you are from experience and from different parts of the world, what is the status of heritage science or conservation science? Can we just have a little bit of free-flowing um, thoughts, um, your two cents in this? What is the status today? How is it? Can we throw some light on it? So I, I can jump in here and, and say that the Mellon Foundation over a 10 or 12 year period changed how conservation science is practiced in the United States. Angelica Rudenstein met with museums, found what was missing in the world of conservation and then set about to fill that, that gap. And she worked with museums, she established labs, she established endowments for positions, um, programs and changed how conservation science, which was ailing in the United States into something that is very robust and long lasting. So it's, it, yeah, it's having somebody who, and Austin I know worked very closely with her on a number of those, those programs and could maybe talk more about how that, that happened, but it really made a world of difference in the United States as to how conservation science is perceived. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that my institution has a long history of it and has always valued it, but that's not the same for every institution. I mean, on that note, Ryan, I absolutely agree with you that we had a champion in Angelica who, um, who recognized the need for a much broader um, strategy for heritage science or conservation science rather. Um, I would say that at the moment in, in Europe and definitely in the UK, there is a great deal of momentum around various branches of science. Whether or not that has anything to do with conservation is a bigger question uh, because a lot of money is now being invested in heritage science. But I'm not seeing this actually happening as much in conservation laboratories. We have in teaching conservation and educating conservators and working with curators, as Ryan said, we are absolutely at the, at the, at the nexus of different disciplines. But uh, we, we always find challenges regarding the very high costs of maintaining instrumentation, for example, on staying on top of the innovations which have introduced many new um, analytical techniques, for example, that we can now purchase. But this is still a, a, a small field. It is a small field with, uh, with very limited resources. And as a head of department, in an institution, I have to balance the needs for scientific investment and conservation investment. And uh, those are not straightforward uh, because we, uh, th there is a huge need to, to really understand what information I need in, in, in inquiry, technical inquiry, art history, and conservation. Maybe I don't need to know what isotopes I have inside of my uh, Egyptian blue pigment to find a strategy so that it doesn't flake off my wall painting. Um, now, knowing that I have specific isotopes might tell me where that pigment was made and how it was made, which is very important too. Um, but I think that in the context of the need for science, we always, we find ourselves often having to make these kinds of uh, uh, decisions. And I'm sure that's, that also ties in perhaps with what Alison was saying about the the, the, what is important for people? Is it more important that they know um, where Egyptian blue comes from or more important that that Egyptian blue stays on the fragment we have, for example, in a museum? If I may try to chime in at this point, because you were asking about where is heritage science standing now, Anupam. I think from our perspective in Berlin, where we look back to 100, and 32 years of history of this laboratory. There definitely have been highs and lows. You know, when this laboratory was founded in 1888, just to recall ourselves, the humanity didn't know whether the Bronze Age was before the Iron Age or the Iron Age was before the Bronze Age. That was a time when 20 year old chemist Friedrich Radkin started his job. Over the years, over the, over the century, things have changed. And I would like to give also some credit to, to India because you know we're talking about the prospects of heritage science in India. And last year, our colleague um, Sanchita Balachandran published an interesting paper talking about a chemist setting up a laboratory in, in the Matras Government Museum, Dr. Paramasivan in the 1930s actually predating the famous laboratories of New York and Paris. You know, you may know the Louvre laboratory was founded in 1935 and the Metropolitan 1937. So we look back to a, a long history of conservation science in India as well. And I think that what Alison was mentioning, the importance of the other sciences now, social sciences, um, is gaining importance. And maybe, you know, we all find ourselves now in a time of economic constraint. And I assume the situation will not get better soon. We have a 75% decline in visitors in our museums worldwide. I'm sure at the former Prince of Wales Museum, you experience a similar experience as we do in Berlin. We are to, at the level of 20, 25% of our pre-crisis visitors. 
So certainly we'll have less money and less funds, but the social importance is important and it's gaining importance. Just want to mention, I don't want to elaborate on this now, but just want to mention the big challenges we have as a society, as a human society, right? Climate change, the digital age, the fourth industrial revolution, questions of identity, post-colonialism, who owns culture? These are all questions which are asked to us by the people on the street in Germany, in the United States, everywhere. And so the need of actually connecting heritage science, not only science and art, but science and business and law and social sciences is more urgent than ever. We just have to, you know, maybe live through times of constraints and times of, of lacking funds for sure. But we've been through this already. It's not the first time. So we get through this as well this time. Okay, so when it comes to, um, um, so one thing that came up during these, um, these thoughts that were put forth is that um, um, the relevance uh, in terms of, do we do, do we bring the science in conservation uh, for the sake of doing very high end research, like Austin said that, um, um, you know, it's about understanding the elements that, that make up the object for maybe some practical application, for example, of maybe preparing the catalog or understanding um, how it behaves on, uh, on the substrate and how to prevent it from falling apart, let's say. So it informs a very, very practical, um, uh, it informs a very practical, um, essential a requirement of the profession. So this is something like a quotidian sort of a day-to-day -day practical application of the science. And then on the other end, you have very high end um, uh, analysis and documentation, which also has its purpose, of course. And that balance that has to be met in terms of investing in the resources. So whether do you really invest from your budgets onto those resources in your institution when that instrument is gonna be used like six times a year, or would you rather share that resource with other institutions and converge those resources together, right? So when we're talking about this, there is also this thing about how do we drive this? We have art conservation practice and we have conservation science and we have this drive to do research. So how is it that, how, how is it that conservation practice drives the research questions for conservation science? Mm -hmm. Nevin, you expressed it right at the beginning. If you could start this off, and then I think others would like to, you know, how is it that it, the, how does the practice drive the research? Because after all, when we're talking about conservation science and research as a very important element of this whole program, how does it? So this is where I, I, I am, uh, you know, a very proud educator. And I feel that the way you empower conservators is through education. And it's if conservators are driving conservation science, then it will be relevant. And uh, I think that it's, uh, of course, we have scientists who are you know, like Narayan and Alice and Stefan and I are all scientists by background. We studied science first, but uh, Alice and Narayan and I all studied conservation too. And uh, Stefan has been teaching conservation. So this is, uh, uh, we spent many years studying conservation. And my, my view is that if conservators are empowered to ask questions, um, then we will have great science. And the, the risk is, of course, that uh, we should not define great science by the number of citations that we have uh, for an article, for example, on which I shared Narayan's article on um, the studying of the impressions of uh, medieval punch marks, which is very relevant for conservation. That's not a paper that has got a lot of citations. It doesn't matter. But uh, we need to find other ways of defining the impact of our research. And as I think Alison and, and, and Stefan and you were mentioning, the, the impact might be much more difficult to measure than a citation. Uh, but my view is that good research doesn't necessarily have to be the research that shows up on a, a high impact, very expensive Western journal. Um, if we consider the, the, some of the most important understandings in conservation are not published 
in, in traditional ways. And we, we have also discussed at the IIC that oftentimes a, a conference presentation about a particular material can have a huge impact because that will reach many conservators. So the use of certain materials, for example, may have large, uh, a large impact uh, on, on conservation practice. And uh, it will take a long time for us to realize this. Uh, in, uh, so I, I think that it's, it's quite difficult to, to, make a, to, to provide a really simple answer to that, but I would say empowering conservators and giving conservators the necessary uh, knowledge, scientific training, so that they can work very closely with scientists and so that they are able to speak the language of the scientists who might be the ones who will find the best adhesives uh, for the 21st century in climates which are changing, or might be able to find new solutions for, for stopping salts crystallizing. Uh, that's what will, you know, I look forward to that moment. So we have a lot of questions still uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the new scientists, but I think that it is important that conservators are able to, to engage with science. Uh, and that, that's the way I would, I, would, I would try to focus my energies. I, I couldn't agree more, Austin. That's such, a, such an important point. It's about asking the questions, having people who are educated to ask the right questions. And that also focuses your research. What you were talking about earlier with the um, Egyptian blue is somebody having a hammer looking for nails. And this is real. If you know what you're asking, why you're asking it, you can then answer those questions and the research coalesces and becomes relevant and important. It's also so important that you were, you were saying that the publications in high profile journals are not necessarily the best measure of their success. That's such, a, such an important point because it's multidisciplinary. It can take a long time to produce a publication because we're getting input from all these different disciplines and they all operate at their own speed. So we can't publish at the same speed as scientists, pure scientists. We might publish in a very active way, maybe one article a year, but that's a, that's a really good output. It's very different from people who are working in, you know, just in the, the hard sciences alone. Mm -hmm. it's, it's worth keeping what you said was such a nice sort of um, roundup of, of many of the values that we hold close. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I would also like to say I, I fully I fully concur also with what Austin said about the need for greater involvement of, of, of conservators within research. I would even go further than just saying, oh, they pose questions. I would say actual active involvement in the actual design of research so that it is uh, really, you know, takes on board the, the, the real um, practice context challenges that, that might make key, uh, you know, sort of experimental design differences in, in the way in which research is conducted. And also really the need for um, through education, I think is a very good way um, for greater research readiness within the conservation community. I would also add though, that I would like to see greater, not just that conservators learn the language of scientists, but that scientists actually learn the language of conservation. It's got to go both ways if it's going to be a dialogue. And there needs to be, I think on the one hand, empowerment. And I think there also has to be humility on both sides, recognizing that actually what we're talking about is science as a service, it's an applied science. And in, you know, to directly answer that question about the, the need for blue skies research, where the real applied, relevant, impactful research, I would say if, if funds are limited, it should, the focus should be more on the latter, for sure. Um, but I think there is a need for a greater recognition that uh, exactly as Austin was saying, that, that, that the, the, the impetus for research really does start um, with, with needs and it's a greater understanding of needs is, is what is needed. <laughs> we need a greater understanding of needs, yeah. <laughs> um, Stefan? Um, yeah, I'd like, like to add on that one, one dimension maybe because you know, in the sciences are also, let's say, let's take as an example, computer science, right? None of us is a computer scientist, but we all know how important is computer science today. Um, we need also the, the questions which are driving us. We need these questions to be interesting and relevant for the computer scientists. 
we need the professors at the universities uh, embracing that not as a service to us or to conservatives or to museums, but these questions need to be so interesting that they are generating interest in themselves. Otherwise we cannot expand the small field of conservation science or conservation a, a, across the borders which we are facing, right? So, so what, what Ryan was saying in the beginning, I think is, is really important that he spoke about this, this respect and the dialogue between the disciplines. And, and you know, many of us work in museums and many of us know that this is very nicely to be said on a Sunday, but very difficult to do on a Monday and on a Tuesday because it's, it's hard. It, it needs redundancy, it needs efforts on all sides. Um, but this is our life. And honestly, in my career, it always gets interesting when all these disciplines come together and really collaborate. Then it gets more interesting than if we were just stuck in our silos, chemistry, mm. you know, mm. art history, archeology, span ethnology, whatever. It gets interesting when we cross the border, when we have the courage to cross this border and also you know, be respectful, as Narayan was saying, in, in, in understanding our own limits. Um, with our perspective to things and, uh, you know, from the other discipline as well, understanding the, the, the limits science has, because science has limits. And, and, and maybe if I can say this here, um, very often in, in, in our museum, we have 19 museums, you know, I'm, I'm confronted with art historians, archaeologists who think, now I'm asking the scientist the question and he's going to solve it. Well, we see now, we have actually a good lesson with COVID-19 that science progress is slowly and science doesn't have answer to everything. And, and maybe that's a good lesson for our colleagues and friends on the human, uh, you know, human humanities side, um, that we are not the ones to provide 100% black and white answers to everything. So this respectful dialogue, I think Narayan was emphasizing, I can, I can only concur. It is, it, is, it is what makes our life or daily life in the museums interesting but also challenging. Mm. Yeah. Stefan, many, um, many feel that, um, uh, that um, uh, conservation science and practical conservation, they are increasingly becoming more divergent. Is it a justified sort of a thought or is it are they really getting divergent? People say that, you know, with all the papers that are being published with these, um, it's not that it can always, they are in a language which is not accessible to those who don't have an advanced education in science. So do you need uh, some person like um, a via media to be able to convey this to the conservators? Do we have to look at our systems in that light also? Because the people who are doing the conservation science are doing good work. And the practical conservators mean well and they want to absorb it, but they feel there is a little chasm there. There is a little bit of a rift, you know? Yeah, well, yes, there's a, there's a rift, but there's organizations who do a great job to disseminate knowledge across the academic boundaries. Ikram is a good example and Alison can talk more to this. Ikram works with the people on the ground all across the globe. Um, I believe that um, even within science, we have borders, we have huge divides. Um, if I may say so, this is, you know, I'm German public servant, right? But I would like to give a shout out to Science Hub. Totally illegal, probably in Orion, in your country, and probably the same in Germany. But, you know, the lady who's making this website, she's helping to tear down the walls for knowledge, for everybody to access literature and knowledge. And I think we have these boundaries in our own field too. And um, yeah, I, but I wouldn't say they are diverging. I think they're, you know, they're getting maybe over time closer together, but um, it needs efforts and it needs to understand definitely that while the scientists and the engineers, they need, of course, they need the, the journals and they need the publications. They need the science quotation index. Of course we do. But we also need the work on the ground and the dissemination of knowledge beyond the academic walls and 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 Ikram and 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 you Anupam you know with your work in the in the Himalayan I mean you work you do this work and and I think it's very very rewarding to actually not only think in the academic ivory uh, tower perspective yeah I, I wanted to 
just say how important it is to talk to the people on the ground and find out, you know, either there's a, a tradition of how something's made or the people who are working there or the native custodians of something to talk to them and find out about the traditions, what's being done, how it's done. And that also is such an important part of, it's, it's such an important piece of information that feeds into how we understand and interpret our results as well. And we just need to, we can't, I, I think one of the things that I, I become frustrated with as a scientist and working with scientists is their lack of ability to talk to people who are non-specialists. There's a, a real, um, people stay within their field, they stay within the jargon, the protection and safety of where they're working. And actually, if you really understand what you're doing, you can explain it to anybody. And to be able to do that is one of the really important parts of working as a conservation scientist so that you can talk to conservators, you can talk to curators, you can talk to the people who are the, looking after the, the culture that we're supposed to be protecting and explain what we're doing, why we're doing it. And it's something that, you know, it, 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 it's such an important part of, of the work we do, which is communication to not be intimidating because people traditionally think of science as, a, as an intimidating field, but it doesn't have to be at all. Well, I think that's, uh, sorry, I, I was just going to respond to Narayan there. I think that's a really important point that you raised there. And it's to do with the psychology of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Like, especially when you are working in an interdisciplinary way, although I would argue actually often what we refer to as interdisciplinary is actually multidisciplinary. Um, I think conservators are actually quite good at being interdisciplinary. Um, but perhaps many scientists are less so. Um, and I think it's a really important point that you raise about the, first, first and foremost, the avoidance of jargon, but I think it's with, um, it's, it's important to recognize the need for, for what you call psychological safety. Mm -hmm. Like, in, and that comes back again to the word that has come up several times, which is respect. And it means that when you are working in an inter interdisciplinary field, you have to acknowledge that there's a kind of going beyond your own disciplinary comfort zone. And that actually to do really good and really creative, exciting work, the sort of work that Stefan's referring to, it requires everyone to go outside their comfort zone and maybe be at risk of asking the stupid question, you know, but I think that what really were in teams that uh, having worked in many teams <laughs> and teams that have worked brilliantly together and teams that have maybe not been fired on all cylinders, I think it is really, you know it works when you feel safe just to pitch in with a question or an idea and you don't feel like you have to be, you know, worried about being clever or worried about whether or not uh, you've got something wrong and that's a really important aspect I think in working uh, across boundaries like this with in, in, in conservation science and in conservation. Maybe there's something also that I think we've all raised this 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 need that we have as scientists to be on the ball learning new things every day as we expect conservators to do. Um, Conservation is, a, is not a, uh, is a very dynamic field where what we understand now is very different from what we understood 10, 20, 30 years ago. And I, I like the fact, Stefan, that you mentioned computer science and you know, the digital humanities and the need, I think, Narayan, you mentioned the open data. This is a relatively new idea for many people, but it's, we, are on, we need to understand what that means as scientists and to, to explain what that means to, to emerging conservators and to find ways of ensuring that people who trained a long time ago can uh, learn the new terminology rather than jargon. So that, so that it's not a question of, of talking down to somebody if we, if we, if we, if we use a term that is, uh, that, is, that, is, that is a 21st century term, but rather we do need to ensure that there are mechanisms where people can actually update and learn and, and learn new new techniques 
the, the, the advances that we've seen in science and portable technologies are, 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 are breathtaking. And at the same time, uh, Raman, that's 19, you know, won the prize in 1930. Uh, and, and we're using that technique today to drive uh, conservation science. So it's not a question of reinventing the wheel, but rather updating our knowledge constantly. And I think that maybe is something that we, we, we might take for granted. I've been asked oftentimes, which chemistry book should we look, use in, in, this, in, in teaching conservation? Should we use the one from 2000? And I said, well, chemistry is chemistry, right? Um, but actually it isn't because what we understand now is so much different from what we used to expect people to know. And that's, that's also a challenge for us because uh, I, I keep on wanting to add more science uh, to, to conservation training, but we have a fin finite amount of time. So how do you do it? You, you, you empower those conservators so that they can find out on their own if they need to. And I would, I would also raise the question, Austin, as well, as to which types of science. I mean, we all come from uh, natural sciences backgrounds. But I would argue in the future, and especially when you're talking about different types of heritage, digital heritage, you know, uh, many different evolving marginal forms of heritage going forwards, that we're going to need very, very different types of science in conservation science. And I would argue that it is conservation science, not heritage science as a broader concept. It's conservation science, because really, as I said, you know, conservation begins with things being of value to people. You know, without the value to people part, there's no need for conservation. So we really are about recognizing and, and conserving values. Okay, for, you know, uh, very much linked with tangible heritage. And I see that that material aspect of conservation science will certainly not uh, you know, diminish or, 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 or be uh, replaced in any way. But I think that there's a need for an expansion and enrichment uh, in many, many areas. I mean, I mentioned already, you know, social sciences, as conservators do far more things like, you know, connecting and working with stakeholders, doing community-based projects. Here, social sciences can be fantastically helpful. And I would argue that is also part of conservation science. It's not just what takes place in laboratories. <laughs> well said, Alison. Uh, and, uh, you know, picking up from this aspect about social, so whether it is social sciences, as Alison mentioned, or it is the pure sciences that Austin uh, was talking about, uh, you know, you mentioned that it is about the terminologies of the 21st century. I would like to um, also offer that, um, the terminologies of the 16th century and the 17th century are equally relevant. So I think the understanding of terminologies, be it contemporary or be it the earlier ones, which are more connected to the actual people who create these artifacts and they are sort of disassoci disassociated from the system. You know, they alienated from this entire conversation about artifacts and the materiality of art objects and the materials and techniques of art objects is simply because their language is not in the academic stage as such. So while we take the stage and talk about how these things were created, the actual creator of these art forms, and that is cultural heritage and the living, these are living traditions also. And it would be a pity and the world would be so much more poorer if these local terminologies are also uh, they fall by the wayside. That would be a real pity, you know? So I think this communication, uh, this ability to understand terminologies, I think should be the responsibility of also the people who are, I mean, when you listen to classical music, you're expected to understand this is an andato, or this is an allegro assai or something like that. So you, it's about your culture. It's about culturing yourself towards, uh, uh, but I say this because Narayan, um, as one of the mentors of the program, um, when we are talking about building up a conservation training, pro a conservation science training program, and uh, lots of thoughts have come forward just now, I think if this thing has been flagged, that that communication is could be better. If that communication could be better, then should we also not build into the system for conservation science and research training also the element of grooming or giving some inputs on how to train the people who sort of bridge this gap also. That could be a wonderful, small, selfless community who 
bridges the gap for others. I think it would be a nice thought to think about it too. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, to, to help people, I mean, what, when we, we're choosing postdocs, what we do is look for people who naturally have that as an ability. We don't, and then we, we have them work on that as they spend three years with us and then go out into the field. But if you have that as a training, then it puts it into people's minds early on. And that only has to be a good thing, you know? So yes, please put it in there straight away. Right. So I will ask one, maybe, one more maybe. question before yeah. I open it out a bit to others. Um, mm -hmm. um, um, it'll follow from um, the rest of the conversations that will happen now. Stefan, after you, please. Well, I, I, I just remember the sentence which was said by Narayan in the beginning. Um, which is also actually kind of the mission statement in our laboratory. He said, we're not afraid of sharing knowledge, even if unfinished. I would even emphasize this part of a sentence because this is quite a different picture from what we know from the traditions of museums worldwide, you know, being secretive, being not talking about the provenance, where the objects come from, right? Being not opening the books. Um, the idea of sharing actually of not being afraid of sharing knowledge, even if unfinished, is something which maybe, you know, it's a little bit more coming from the science side because we're used to this need to actually bring our results to the discourse, to the discussion in the scientific community. But I'm not so pessimistic. I'm actually thinking when I think about my students at the, at the university in Berlin, they are driving this. They are asking these questions. They would like to break down these barriers. Um, they are not happy with anybody who doesn't want to share knowledge. And don't, I mean, that would be my, my, my you know, call. I would say, look, you know, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to share. And also don't be afraid to learn from the communities, as you were saying, Anupam, you know, who have a long tradition, how to make their mural paintings in the Himalaya, right? How to, I mean, identify with this, try to listen and learn from this. And what makes me optimistic is, you know, I live between the movable heritage in the museums and the immovable heritage in, in conservation of monuments. This is my career. It goes from this side to this side. And and in, in essence, you know, we have two organizations, ICOM and ICOMOS, right? I think the last time they really met was in 1966. It's just the two letters which are separating them. But the ethics and the, and the, the, the discussion behind is the same. We, we, we are observing in the last 20 years, maybe, a an, an transition from the curatorial preservation to a more ecologic preservation, where the people you know, look at the Black Lives Matter movement, the Confederate monuments discussion in the US, look at, at how people take over the discussion about what means cultural heritage for them and why they want to preserve it. And I would say, you know, I definitely endorse what Narayan was saying, share the knowledge, tear down the walls, even if unfinished, don't be afraid because the students and the public and the people, they want that. They want us to share this knowledge. Do not be secretive. Do not try to hide it because you're on a, only going to lose, actually, on long term. The patience of the young people is not so big. They're not going to wait for us. You know, They want to get answers for this question. And I actually think one of the underlying messages that we have here is to risk being vulnerable. And if we're vulnerable and we take that risk, then the payoffs come. So I just wanted to... Thing. It's about not being afraid to collaborate, to, to collaborate outside your normal sphere, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I do think that actually good collaboration skills are definitely things that can be part of training. Um, and especially if you do interdisciplinary training, you know, where scientists and conservators actually train together in, in uh, education programs and also through project-based learning is a really good way because you bring like real real case uh, scenarios real real problems that, that need to be resolved so it's not so abstract right uh, this is an opportunity also to um, uh, to invite all the ladies and gentlemen who are listening to this program to please type in your questions if you have any as we carry on this conversation. 
um, and we'll have your questions in and we'll build them into this um, into this uh, discussion that we are having. Um, taking a lead from uh, the previous um, aspect that we talked about, um, so we talked about this beautiful thing about don't be afraid to um, to announce and share the unfinished works. I think that is really, really beautiful because that is something that has um, stopped us from, you know, we there's a bit of peer pressure. We feel a little embarrassed. Is it good enough? So I think we should not be, you know, we should not be. And uh, on that count, um, um, I think that's something that has then to be instilled into not just the practitioners, but also the students who are slowly, slowly getting into the fold and, you know, coming forth into... Uh, into this field. Um, one thing. So maybe that, on this uh, note, uh, I'm wondering, Anupam, to say this, I think we, we also recognize all of us the, that there is a danger in sharing. And uh, YouTube is one example. We're on YouTube now, as I understand it, but I think we've all seen the YouTube videos of conservation treatments, which make us crazy. And this is open access, shared, free information. And it's very tricky because in discussing, it's not recipes that we're sharing or muffins or uh, you know, wallpaper techniques here. We're talking about our heritage. And it's actually quite important to be responsible in what we share rather than sharing because we want more clicks on Instagram. And uh, I'm really serious because I think it's, it's, a, it's really bad for the field to see shoddy treatments being done online with millions of likes. Um, and, with the, and this is really not what we should be sharing. Um, mm -hmm. So, but the, you, 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 you put across a very important point because one of the questions that is being raised these days, especially with the institutions in lockdown, is that... Um, um, do we go ahead with online learning to teach conservation audiences, not just in our institutions for conservation, but also a broader audience? You got to weigh that carefully also in that context. And how effective is it to be able to convey all these learnings in an online medium? I'm really happy with online, um, Anupam, because we, we're talking now and I feel like this is the, this is the 21st century now. Uh, so we shouldn't be spending our money on airline tickets and expensive travel if we can communicate uh, in efficient ways. But it's very difficult to teach certain things online. You can't, you don't have the same experience now. Um, but for example, I love the fact that in uh, anatomy, you can now do virtual dissections. As a vegetarian, I like the idea that you don't have to kill the frog to do a dissection more than once. So I, I, I will welcome the new technologies for us when we are able to really experience spectroscopy in uh, or microscopy in new ways. Uh, this is where, uh, but I, I think there is also the element of, uh, it's very difficult to judge our reactions on a Zoom call. Um, I understand Zoom is making new ways of interacting with each other. So we can smell the coffee that you're drinking or the something else. But uh, I think this is part of embracing technology, isn't it? Uh, however, we can't replace the 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 one-to-one the -one teaching that you need with observation of the object, the real object, or the real sight. That's 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 a unique uh, experience. May I, as the moderator, um, uh, intro? Um say one thing that as we are drawing towards the close of the program, um, and because we have talked about so many issues, um, how about one tangible example, a few tangible examples of let's say, how pure scientists have addressed a certain issue faced by curators? Because the audience here today is extremely diverse. And I think a few examples, nothing like that, you know? Some examples of how the pure science has actually impacted a curatorial issue or something. Just a few offhand examples, there's so many. Well, I, I, I can give you one example out of our daily work. And I think everybody working in conservation has this nice experience that every Monday is a new adventure coming on. Um, we had last year um, recovered five master paintings 
which were stolen in 1979 from a German museum, the biggest theft of East German history. Um, they were lost for 40 years, most famous painters. And, um, you know, the, the, the scientific investigation of these paintings, our task was to find out, are those the original paintings stolen in 1979? Or is this maybe something different? And it was really exciting. And, and I can give, because there's so many, you know, conservators here also with the conservation background. I can give one example why, you know, those little marks on the back of a panel painting, um, you know, discovered and studied actually by our colleagues in Denmark, um, by Jürgen Wadum, uh, helped us to date a panel painting back to the Peter Bruegel's workshop in, 19, in 1610 in Antwerp. Um, and only by chance, not covered, you know, by the conservation, structural conservation on the back um, of, of, of that panel. And this kind of adventure, of course, comes um, every week. And, and if there's a diverse audience, I can only encourage everybody uh, to join the field of conservation. It's maybe not well paid and it's maybe not really uh, you know a perspective of making a huge income but it's it's wonderfully exciting and at the crossroads of all these disciplines and and join us for this adventure you know come and we have huge challenges the green museum your, climate change, just uh, come for it <laughs> your adventure austin with your students and something very interesting sorry no, no. your adventure on the amalgam of science and actual practical application no, well, I would say that the, the joy for me is really in the discovery. I think that Stefan was suggesting that, that to, to, when you look at a painting in a microscope and you realize the complexity of the materials and to, to witnessing this with the students is what is, 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 is really meaningful because the, the, the text we read about mixing pigments and grinding pigments and, and applying them suddenly makes sense when you see how beautiful and crazy uh, a painting can look under a microscope. And that's something that we witness every day, the use of technology to see closer. Uh, and it allows us to understand layers and understand uh, dynamics. And uh, it's, it's really a very important aspect of the way we treat paintings and observe samples. So I say this is for me is a, a really practical example. Thank you. Alison, something on an international perspective in terms of Ikram's work, maybe in sites and communities, I don't know, there will be so many to choose from. I'm just trying to think in terms of, um, yeah, I, I think, I think, I mean, I've already mentioned one example that I thought was a piece of research that was just so, so great was, was the one that really focused on uh, handling of heritage objects in, in, in hospitals, and how that was actually proven to reduce the length of time with the, the of bed occupancy that people needed to stay in hospital. Whether that, though, is the actual handling of the object itself or the, the, the memories that that, that stimulates or, or just the interaction with the researchers, I think mm -hmm. is quite difficult. Beautiful. But Very it's a really nice. nice example if you want one. Very nice. And then yeah. I was just thinking on, on Austin's point, if I may very quickly, just really, it's those amazing moments. For example, I remember... Um, Oh goodness! Doing uh, multispectral imaging a long, long, long time ago with uh, with my now husband, um, and uh, just just suddenly seeing all this amazing pentimenti underneath the, the wall paintings, and just thinking, "Wow, nobody's seen that in hundreds of centuries." You know, this is such those sorts of things are a real privilege. Wonderful. Narayan, something particular you want to give an as an example? Yeah, I, I was thinking about this. Our um, treatment of the Rothko murals at Harvard was a... I was thinking too, yes. Yeah, for, for me, it was a great moment where we were able to use computer science to recreate a map of the lost colour and then project that map onto the paintings so that we could then appreciate the paintings as they looked when they were done in the 1960s. So... What it was was a, a non-invasive treatment new for paintings conservation that allowed us to appreciate the work of art without even touching the work of art and we couldn't have done that without computer scientists at MIT we couldn't have done it without people who understood the fading of dyes in color photographs at the University of Basel and we couldn't have done it without my colleague Jens Stenger who is a an artist, he's a physicist, 
and he also knows how to code. So he had this amazing set of abilities that allowed us to bring this project to fruition. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And I have two minutes, so um, I'll chip in with my example. And that is, uh, when we came to Bombay, there was this phenomenon, this profusion of uh, fungus growth on paintings and art objects in Bombay with this high humidity and this, uh, the atmospheric pollution. And uh, while everybody has, you know, books are written about what fungicides to use and things, uh, we said, why not try it on the ground and ground truth it? And then we tied up with um, the microbiological um, department of uh, the college across the road, Elphinstone College. And then we tied up with these um, microbiologists and we tested out all the various materials that are used in India as fungicides in different concentrations. And what we got as a result has saved the collection at the CSMVS uh, for the last six, seven years. And it's worked extremely well so as a practical application. So um, this is excellent. So uh, we have actually hit the dot on the time of our panel discussion. And we are all conservators and we are all scientists. And we um, are precise in terms of this panel discussion also. I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank all of you very much for uh, taking time to be with us. And we look forward to continuing uh, conversations and association in the years to come um, for this program and for uh, other associations related to the conservation of cultural heritage. And a big thank you to all the people who made this possible, who organized this, and uh, to all the participants who are together with us today uh, through this evening. I'd like to thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. And uh, we will transcribe uh, the proceedings of today and send them back to you. And let's hope they translate into um, a tangible um, uh, program in the years to come. By the way, next week on Thursday again, at 7.30 p.m. India time, which would be about 2 o'clock GMT, and how much would it be in Eastern Pacific time? 9 a.m. 9 a.m. All right. So um, um, we have the second panel discussion, which focuses particularly uh, for South Asia. And uh, before we close, um, uh, we have a panel discussion in a week. So if there are any thoughts on that panel discussion related to South Asia, some thoughts that you feel we should take on as um, a thread of conversation to be picked up in the second panel discussion, I'll be very happy to hear and then we say goodbye.